a rally one day doesn't in any way. I think that it also, you know, the Canon 28, they're put on trial. My dad was um, charged, it was like a conspiracy charge that hadn't been used in a really long time. So the federal government, so in my town, they were trying, my dad was trying in Ithaca, and he was, nine of the 12 jurors voted to acquit him in Ithaca, which is pretty awesome. The federal government came in, re-indicted them, charging with conspiracy, moved the trial to a whole different town. Mm -hmm. But in that, in that whole process of this trial, there was a citizen's tribunal, so they brought in all these speakers to talk about the war in Iraq. It, again, mobilized an entire community and created a movement. So I think that like, to say that it's, to, yes, people got upset, people got pissed off, but I also think- Not in that case. Well, I was saying people got pissed off that, that they had done property damage before, like you're destroying things, you like messed up the flag, like that became a huge issue. But I think it also started a conversation that wouldn't have happened, and it started a movement that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So I think that that shouldn't be underestimated. Well, I, th I think that the, you know, uh, that particular example the, 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 of, of the uh, usually the Catholic um, uh, activist, uh, pacifist, uh, went in and, and, and um, destroyed the draft card, the uh, draft board files, um, they often use the necessity defense. And, and um, they often won. And they certainly did push the movement along yes. toward the mass movement. So in that particular case, I agree with you. Well, yeah, and I also think that something else that we've talked about of like these movements going towards violence, I don't think we should underestimate the state pushing violence on these groups as well. Because like, so my grandfather, the Canon 28, Anyway, their group was infiltrated by an FBI agent who was pushing them to use violence. He was like, I'll get you guys guns, I'll get you guys all this stuff. And they were like, that's not our mission, that's not where we're going. But I don't think, I think that this probably happened in way more groups than you than you think Everybody. that the government is pushing that because it's a way to crack down and it's a way to... But notice the distinction between essentially what your grandfather was involved in was non-violent civil disobedience. Right. But and it's not, also property, I guess that just the way you define property destruction, I feel like that what you did would fall under how you define property. Now, not, uh, you're, you're called, you, 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 drew, you drew a better distinction than I did. You know? okay. yeah. let's, let's call on, on people who haven't uh, talked. Yes? Uh, you. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed um, hearing your whole story. And uh, now I want to actually read your uh, book. Um, you <laughs> uh, can get it for $1.67. Uh, <laughs> all right, great. Um, well, uh, my name is Darwin, uh, and I, uh, I'm a proud occupier. Um, last uh, semester, I was a uh, DC participant in the Occupy um, camp. And I, since um, being back on campus, I found um, an avenue to continue that with uh, the Occupy Grinnell group. And, I've really been proud of um, the few actions we've had in the discussion, but uh, I, I wanted to draw on what you said in your talk about um, the fact that uh, movement, um, social movement, sometimes uh, there's divisiveness when there's uh, a group such as the Weather Underground that decides to become leaders and go in a different direction. Um, and I see um, in the discussion that I was part of in DC, there was a lot of uh, possible fractioning off. Um, uh, there's a ton of subcommittees within these, uh, at every city's groups. Uh, but there's a discussion um, that I mentioned to you um, earlier, which was about whether there should be a spokesperson or a leader for these, uh, for the movement, and whether that's, um, if that's effective, and the, the consensus in DC is that it's uh, not wanted, um, and that this is a real um, example of democracy where everyone has the equal chance to speak up, and it's a real town hall discussion. But um, I guess the this uh, problem I have, I guess, with the term mass movement is that there's I, I feel like that calls on there being one determined um, set agenda or focus and there being a leader that will take that group there. But I, I see the Occupy group as having um, a lot of um, issues that they want to take on and a lot of possible uh, leaders. And uh, I guess, would your advice be for the Occupy movement uh, to 
stay away from uh, adopting any leader? And if so, how do you uh, tackle the fact that uh, uh, public officials, um, city governments are going to criticize them that they don't have someone that they can speak to? Um, and that's that's and even worse, the media doesn't have anybody to yeah. speak to. You know, because that's the way the media works. I mean, I'm a media product. Uh, I don't have an answer to these questions. So they're, they're, um, I do think, I know that the, that the experimentation, the, the direction the Occupy, Occupy movement has been going in has been um, uh, to downplay leadership. You know? Although there is such a thing as real leadership, de facto leadership. The women's movement struggled with this a lot. And um, there was a very brilliant essay that was published in 1970 called The Tyranny of Structurelessness. You can find it on the web. The problem of how de facto um, uh, um, cliques get started that are, that are not accountable. Yeah. You know? On the other hand, if everybody goes off and does their own thing, and if there's a unified strategy, that, you know, but I don't have the answer, but I do know that all effective mass movements have had multiple tendencies with them. Mm -hmm. But they've, had, they've figured out how to create coalition. That's, that's why, again, studying successful mass movements, the civil rights movement in, in the South and in the North was a grand coalition of, 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 of uh, black uh, middle class, black um, uh, uh, street people, um, uh, black churches, um, black revolutionaries, white labor, um, religious, white and black, and, and it, I mean, it's a grand coalition, but it wasn't without its tensions. So I don't have this solution to it. It's gonna, it's, it's gonna be the work of the rest of your life, Carl. Yeah, thank you. you know, and your kid's life. Yes? Yeah, I guess what I was talking to thinking about the self-consciousness of organizations, what, how they picture themselves actually in the data and support their goals. And so, you kind of rewind a little bit. You said that kind of the reason that the weather and the caved in on themselves is because they realize they're irrelevance. But you also said that in the SDS, you had a certain air, arrogance about you. Yes. And so I'm wondering, like, what, what is a certain, um, in an organization, what is an effective level of self-confidence, of self-consciousness? I, I, I don't know. Um, um, all factionalism is arrogant. I've got the right answer, and you don't. You know, it happens in churches. You know, there's that, it happens in academic departments. <laughs> you know, the, 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 um, um, the, the joke, which I'm sure all of you have heard, is uh, maybe there might be two people in the room who haven't heard, is why is academic politics so intense? It's because the stakes are so small. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it, it, there's always this arrogance. I don't know how we put aside our egos and our arrogance. You know, even in the Buddhist movement now, there's people who hate the Dalai Lama. They think he's an idiot. <laughs> you know, and and it goes on. I don't know how you do that, but maybe I, I don't know. It's just like I just want to add something a little bit, a little twist, slightly different twist in answering that because human beings are very interesting species, <laughs> and that is that there are times when, you, well, first of all, when you study social movements. You study social movements recognizing that it's when large numbers of people and when significant people are involved for change or for against change, right? So it can be either. It's not just in one direction. That's one, you know, sort of framing it. But the other thing is, is that there are times in which people are against something, and that sets the stack, the deck in a way in which you organize. And then there's a time in which people are for something. And that sets the deck in how you're going to organize. And I think, I think when you study a particular movement, you're looking at what those dynamics are. When you talk about organizing, they're, you know, you're talking about are you organizing to infiltrate a, a structure and get it to move in a different direction? Or are you talking about dismantling a structure, right? So all of those things are part of the dynamic of how you talk about organizing. And then, in either of those, what are you organ what are you mobilizing people to do? Are you organizing mobilizing people to do this, or are you mobilizing people not to do this? So in all of those instances, I think 
And it goes back to your question of where is the confidence and where is the arrogance? And this is what I, this is what my experience with my kids is, is because I also was in a movement which lost its focus, right? Where its focus, where its strategies outran and, and undermined the very larger question that it was asking. And I think where it happens is, is that you, that we have, the movements have to keep asking themselves, what do we do now, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to be, have the skills of assessing what do you do next? Assessment. Right. Assessment. I think that's really important that you have to do that. And you have to assess people. You have to assess what are the cultural dynamics that are operating. Because certainly you can take power and then what? You understand what I'm saying? <coughs> then what? what do you want people to do? Right? Okay? And you can also not be decisive and take power, right? And create anarchy, right? In terms of mobilizing one group of people because they'll turn. So the art of the art of social change is part of what's studied, but in there, there is some part of human beings that seem to be highly mobilized when people see clearly there's something that's not right. That is a, that is a defining factor, that people say, this is not right at some level, and I'm prepared to take a portion of my life, my time, my resources, and say, I'm going to step out of the life I could have, right, and I'm going to do something different. And I think that's that's the key for what happened with SDS. By the way, I remember reading those manifestos and saying, my goodness, this is as, as powerful as reading the Declaration of Independence at that historical time, right? But there's a moment in which trying to employ that, it becomes problematic. And I think the art of being somebody who, if you really want to be a social justice activist for your life, you got to be prepared to, to be that kind of assessor, right? So that your strategies don't make you a fish out of water. Right? Because you're going to then turn the movement on yourself. So you have to develop that art of leadership, that art of when to mobilize, <coughs> that art of when to sort of assess, and that end to let go. Right? Because movements ebb and flow. Right? Okay. I want to say, and um, mass movements ebb and flow. If I could, uh, 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 the question of assessment, how do, we, how do we honestly assess whether our movement is growing? Yeah. In 1969, in October, when we had this national action case break, we, we should have honestly said, we have fewer people now than we had five months ago, right. so we must be doing something wrong. Right. But we said, no, we know we're right. Why? Take about it. Told us we're right. We know we're right, so let's just do it more. No. And we have it right now. The Republican Party believes, okay, they took power in 81 with, with, and, and their, their, their uh, economic policies around deregulation, privatization, um, free market, all of that junk came to a head in 2008, 30 years later almost, and we had an economic collapse. <coughs> so any logical assessment of the situation would say, let's do something different. But they say, no, we know we're right. <laughs> We know the free market will take care of everything, so we need less government and more free market and, and less uh, regulation and less taxes to stimulate the economy, less of it. Uh, how do we know? Because our religion tells us. <laughs> so the question then is, how do we avoid making our ideas into a religion. And I, I call it, if I had been able to uh, 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 name my book, my working title was Idealism and Its Discontents. <laughs> Meaning, you get an idea and you think your idea is right. And the only proof you have of it is that you, it's your idea. That's idealism. The right wing has its forms of idealism. We're going to go to Iraq and bring democracy to those people. You know, by point of. Uh, uh, by